Many of you will, will recognize me because I've been actually serving on Business by the Book. We started counting this morning. I've been working on, I've been serving on Business by the Book for 11 years now. And over the course of those 11 years, sometimes I've been very silent in the background and sometimes I've been very public here at the podium, but usually as the one introducing the one to speak. And so it's a very, it's a very different, it's a very different spin to be standing here as the one doing the speaking having just been introduced. And so I thank you for that. It's, 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 it is interesting. You know, um, this series is called It Takes Two. I think what we've discovered is it takes three. It takes three. And our story actually begins way back in Asia, in Hong Kong in 1995. That's where Michael and I met. We were both, she was working for a very large German company. She was working for the parent of Eddie Bauer and had hundreds of people under her charge manufacturing clothing and distributing. Uh, textiles all over the globe for a series of companies, one of which was Eddie Bauer, Spiegel Catalogs, and a number of other names that you'd, you'd know. And I was in the transportation logistics industry in the shipping business. And uh, so this, they say all things are made in China, and so this Canadian boy met that German girl, and we got married in Hong Kong. And, and so, yeah, this marriage was made there in Asia, and uh, we ended up in Australia. And, and uh, in 2000, we just really felt that it was time to come home. And so our story actually begins in returning to Vancouver. I mean, I had never lived in Vancouver. I was born in Toronto and grew up in Miami and, and uh, started my working career in Asia. And that's where I met Michaela. She had been to Vancouver with me a couple of times just for a day here or a day there. So to say that we returned here was, wouldn't actually be all that accurate. We started a brand new adventure here and didn't know what we were getting into. And I, wow, that's prophetic. We didn't really know what we were getting into. You'll, you'll also notice that I am the, the more talkative of the two. Michaela is the, the strong, silent type. And uh, it's like Greg said, you know, she is sweet and she is silent, but you don't want to mess with her. And, and so she's here to pepper the flavors. You know, it, from a working perspective, there's two different camps. Some of them call me the sales whisperer. Um, because I understand how to get inside the head of the customer, and others, and you'll, you'll also realize what an oxymoron that is, the sales whisperer. Some call me Hurricane Howard. You may, you may see some truth in that. Michaela, in, in the companies that she works with, they call her a production pixie because she magically somehow takes these creative designs that somebody has put on paper and has them magically appear from across the globe in finished form with almost zero defect in it. She's really quite, she's really quite astounding in terms of what she does, but so that's what we were doing in Asia. We carried that work on here. We were living in Australia, and over the years that I was an expat living in Asia, I was constantly getting phone calls to come back home, to come back home by the company that I had been working with. I was working with the, with the parent company of DHL. I was their global account director, and they had been trying to get me back as VP of sales for many years. And finally, in 2000, Michaela decided she had enough of Australia. We spent a couple years down there, and we decided to come to Vancouver, so we loaded two containers. One was filled with furniture and household effects, and one was full, full of motorcycles, and Pastor Dave will know all about that. He's ridden a couple of them. And uh, we ended up here in Vancouver. We landed on a Saturday. We bought a, house on, bought a car on Sunday. We bought a house on Monday. And on Tuesday, while we were out exploring our brand new city, I got a call from the CEO of the organization who brought me back and said, you know, we're in the middle of a merger, and it uh, looks like I've just been merged out. They don't need two VPs, and you're next. And so I was fired from my brand new job before I'd even seen the office. And that's how life in Vancouver began. Um, I won't tell you that whole story because that's not the story we want to tell today, but it kind of gives you a context because from there we then spent the next year and a half looking for work with very high-powered resumes. We couldn't find any work in this town, always believing tomorrow something was going to break and nothing ever broke. And at the end of a couple of years, I ended up working for a small little upstart company. I took a salary of $25,000, which, you know, really paled in comparison to our lifestyle. And... Uh, we ended up losing everything, and I slipped into a catatonic depression. And the last six months of 2000 and 2001, I don't remember half of that year. Mikhail will tell you that those were probably some of the darkest days you remember. And I, I spent six months under the sheets and under the covers. And so without getting too deep into that story, but this is where we first discovered it takes two, because you know the thing is when one is strong, the other one is weak, or when one is weak, the strong one is there to lift. And I, re I forgot half of that year, and that's when Michaela buckled down, unbeknownst to me, and got to business of keeping us alive and finding a way to make us survive and bring enough money in. We lost the house. We are in a little 300-square-foot apartment at Georgia and Butte. And uh, I don't know. One morning, I just felt something tug on my heart. I woke up out of bed. I probably hadn't seen daylight in about six months. And three months later, we, a God that neither one of us knew or were even looking for. We weren't married in any kind of a church. It was a civil ceremony. It was a great party. And then uh, this God that we weren't looking for kind of revealed himself to us. We both saw it, gave me a very strong vision, and said, I've allowed you to go through what I've allowed you to go through because I want you to share what's going to happen. 
to, to, to give hope and courage to those that have lost it. And, and some months later, led me into the front door of Coastal Church where I learned about Jesus Christ, felt the Spirit of God, and became a Christian that morning. And several months later, my wife followed me. And so this brand new couple who knew nothing of God, wasn't married in his presence, were now following him. And then we had a pretty good run for a couple of years, several years, in fact. We started new careers and a new life, and she started a business, and I started a business, and life started carrying on. And, but I want to fast forward to the summer of 2012, almost exactly, actually just a week short, a week and a half short of exactly two years from today. You know, Michaela's German, and her, all of her family there, she's the only one. We're both kind of, we're, we're almost a pair of orphans here in the city. And so every year we go to Germany for, uh, for probably two weeks. And it's a, it's a regular routine. We go to visit her family, see her friends. And on, in, in September of 2012, she says, I don't want to go for two weeks this year. I'd, I'd like to go for three, for three weeks. And I said, well, that's, that's kind. You go for three. I can only afford to go for two. I've got some client work I need to do, so we'll go together. I'll hook a flight home, and then you come back a week later, and I'll just be there at the airport for you. And so that's what we did. We went to Germany. We had a great vacation. Um, and on the Monday that it was time for me to leave, I just remember we, she took me to the train station. It was about a two-hour train ride back up to Frankfurt. Uh, we, we hugged and we kissed and we cried and we celebrated and she was very tearful as I was hopping on the train and I just remember looking back and I said, I said it's going to be alright. I said, tonight I've got to take a taxi. At least next Monday you get, a, you get a ride at the airport. I'll be there waiting for you. It's okay. Have fun with your family. And I got on my plane and I went home. Tuesday I prepared for, uh, I got landed on Monday night. Tuesday I was preparing for some work that I have with a brand new client, a couple day training program that I was getting involved in. And when I'm with a client, anybody who's ever worked with me in this room, some of you have, know that when I'm with client, I don't check emails, I don't check phone messages, I just put 100% of my focus onto you. And it was no different. I was with this client. I was with him all day Wednesday and preparing for the, two, for the Thursday. I went outside. I grilled myself a steak. It was a nice September thing. I was eating dinner. And something prompted me, check your email. Check your email. Check your email. And I resisted it until finally it just kept coming, kind of like that voice that I heard in my living room some years earlier. And so I opened my email, and there was an email from her brother. Basie said, my dearest Howard, you don't realize how fresh it is until you start telling it. <laughs> my dearest Howard, I have some bad news for you about your wife, my sister. She's had a series of strokes. She's in the hospital. She's on life support. And tomorrow she's having surgery on her tumor. <laughs> you better get back here. It doesn't look good. I just kissed her goodbye two days ago. I mean, what happened? <laughs> of course, I get this email. There's tumors. There's strokes. Life support. I, I don't know what to do with this. It's the middle of the night. I can't reach anybody. So I start looking for flights, and the first flight that I can find is, 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 is this following Saturday. It was high season. All the flights were sold out. So the first flight, this was on a Wednesday night. I had just seen her goodbye with the times, actually just 36 hours earlier. So I find a flight. I, I, I hop on that thing. I, I get it, and but nothing Nothing could prepare me for what I was about to see. I flew into Frankfurt. I took the Saturday night flight out. I got in Sunday morning. I drove down to the hospital, got to the hospital probably about 4 o'clock in the afternoon. And this beautiful, vibrant wife, that had, my best friend, who had just kissed me goodbye a couple days earlier, was now in the intensive care unit, shriveled up to, I mean, she was never a heavier girl, but man, I'll tell you what, I had a skinny wife. <laughs> she had probably shriveled down to about 80 pounds. The doctors were saying her, she's anemic, her iron is low, she was down several pints of blood, and, uh, and there she was. So maybe you can just tell what happened and what you experienced. This thing is shrunk again. You're going to have to hold it. <laughs> so what happened? So the Wednesday, I went to town, into town in Baden-Baden, and I just browsed around the stores, and suddenly I was in the store and trying on some jeans, and I felt weird. Something is off. I don't know what. So ignored it, put it aside. I put jeans on. I said, okay, I'll take this one. I go to the counter to pay, and suddenly I just had a flash. It was just like I just was, I blacked out, but I was standing. The, the person behind the counter looked really, looked at me and, and kind of, took my money and said, here's your receipt, and spoke very clear. And therefore, I said, OK, something's wrong with me. The way she looks at me, something is wrong with me. <laughs> then she came and said, your purse just fell down. My purse was on my left shoulder. I had no idea that my purse fell. I said, OK, just freeze, just freeze, just freeze. So I, I took the 
my, the jeans I just bought, just grabbed it and go outside the store. And Baden-Baden is a, is a beautiful town with lots of benches. So I just gunned for the first bench I could see and sat down and said, breeze, breeze. And so, sorry, I sat down and just try to concentrate. What is going on with me? I cannot, I just, everything just is so difficult. It's just so difficult. I stood up and my left, my left arm just basically had no strength. It just, everything dropped. I was wearing that jacket that we just bought the day before and it just dropped. It just, everything just dropped out of my hand. I said, what is wrong? What is wrong with me? It just, it was this overwhelming feel, feeling of, you can't control what you do. It's like some, something was just switched off. I was, I was aware, but I could not do anything. I said, okay, just go home, just go home. So it's about a two kilometer walk. I just, I must have walked the entire street. I crossed several multi-lane traffic. I have no idea how I did it. I know that I sometimes scrubbed along bushes Going back, we walked that, that area which I walked. I don't know how I scrubbed on bushes. I just, that's what I see. I fell a couple of times. I'm as well surprised that nobody actually spoke to me. I know that I went basically from bench to bench until I was two kilometers at my home, at my parents' home. I fell again in front of their door when I walked up the stairs. And just when I finally reached them, I said, I feel just awful. I feel awful. I don't know what's wrong with me. And I, I just had to hang on to everything I was holding. I just had to grip it, like just concentrate on, on holding. And I just stumbled. And my parents said, OK, just maybe you, you're tired. So they, my blood pressure was through the roof. And it's just, OK, just relax, and it will be better tomorrow. So I went to the hotel and said, OK, I'll just sleep. I'll just sleep it off. Tomorrow will be good. So that was in the afternoon on Wednesday. I went to the hotel, and I basically didn't show up at my parents' place until noon the next day. So that's when they got nervous. And that's when they were trying to reach me. And it was a little hotel which had um, Ruhetag, which means it was closed the day I was in. So I had the key to go into the hotel with my room key, but nobody else. There is no reception. There is nobody. So they couldn't get in. So suddenly, I hear my dad yelling my name in front of the building. And I was not able to get up. I hear him. I was not able to get up. So I pulled with all the force. I pulled myself up the, the window. And made it just barely and said, I'm here. He said, you need to let us in. He said, you need to, I can't. I can't get up. We cannot get in. We can't get to you. I can't get up. I can't get up. So with all my voice, I reached for the key and threw down the key. It was a godsend that I was in that window to the front of the building, and nothing was in front of it. I could just drop the key, because I had no strength to throw a key. So they got the key. My parents had talked to their GP. And when he got basically the rundown, how I experienced how I was the day before, he called an ambulance right away. And he came with them to the hotel, and I basically was carried down. That then was brought to the hospital. And then I had a lot of blackout. Yeah. Right there, it's just, I remember one little story when they carried me down the stairs and the ambulance was in front of the building and little kids came by and talked to the paramedic and said, is this just a drill or is this for real? <laughs> I said, oh, that's just a drill. Okay, <laughs> then I wandered off. That's the last thing in the next. And then, you, and then from basically there, she doesn't remember anything else. They got her to the hospital and blackout. And that's where the email from the brother to me shows up in my inbox, and I scramble to get back. So I get back on the, on the Sunday. I get there on the Sunday afternoon. I get into the hospital. I walk into that hospital room, and, and in just five days, four days, she's lost probably 20% of her body mass. Her face was totally, totally asymmetrical, one side high, one side low, not a little, like very significant, 
had whittled down to anything, and so we start piecing together what actually happened. So we start counting and recounting what actually, we figure she probably had a, a five strokes over the course of those two days and had no idea she was having a stroke. Okay, what about this tumor? Where's the brain? I don't see her, she didn't open her. What about that brain tumor? It wasn't a brain tumor. What happened was when they brought her into the hospital, they realized that not only was she anemic and low on iron, but she was also low on blood. And so that when you have a stroke, you have to start thinning the blood. The way you deal with a stroke is to start treating the blood, but when you're, so if you're low on blood, you must be bleeding somewhere, we better go look for the leak because we can't even begin to address the stroke until we figure out where the leak is. And that's when we discovered that she was bleeding, she was having a lot of, well, we're just adults here. Um, she was having a lot of vaginal bleeding. And for almost two years prior to us, this trip to Germany, I mean, we've been, we've been together 19 years, you know, and some women have really difficult menstrual cycles and some women have no issue with them at all. My wife, I never knew whether she's having one or not because she never talked about it, never complained about it, it was not a big deal. And, and I guess probably two years leading up to this, every once in a while I was like, yeah, I'm, not, I'm really kind of having a bad cycle this month. Oh, I mean, really, I'm in a And we started noticing that there, and, and, and some months nothing, and some months really a lot. And, and so we said, well, I don't know, must, must be menopause. And she must be medical. And so we told. So the doctor said to me when I'm in Germany, he says, "How could you miss this?" I said, "Well, we, th we thought it was menopause." He said, "Well, how could you think it was menopause?" I said, "Well, neither one of us have been through it. So what? The <laughs> what the I didn't know what menopause was. I mean." <laughs> So they basically, what they did, the surgery that they did was they went in with some electrical instruments and tried to cauterize the tumor to stop the bleeding so that they could begin then treating the stroke. And that's really where the whole thing started. So I get there on the Sunday. I spend pretty much the whole evening with her. She hadn't eaten since, since the stroke, so she hadn't eaten in a couple of days. Nobody could get any food into her. I managed to get a little something into her, and, and then after, with jet lag and everything, went back to a friend's house. No, here's, here's the amazing thing. So I, I'm, I'm looking at this situation, and I, I basically come to the realization, we're gonna be here a while. This is not a quick fix. Um, she was so paralyzed that I literally had to pick her up from the bed to the wheelchair, take her from the wheelchair to the toilet, toilet back to the wheelchair, and wheelchair back to the bed. She couldn't move, couldn't move her arms, couldn't move. In fact, the only way that we really could communicate, I could speak to her and she could cry back. There were like no words, and that's how we communicated for the better part of a week. And as you watch this, you then come to the realization, wow, we're, we're gonna be here a while. This is, okay, I, I, I have hope. And the amazing thing is, you know, before I left Vancouver, when I got word of this, I instantly forwarded that email off and went to my community and said, I need, I need prayer now. I, I, if I ever needed prayer, now is the time that we need it. And, and so the prayer machine fired up. And, and, and I, you know, if we have time a little later, I'll tell you, we, we're still, we, we, sometimes even today, two years later, we still meet a stranger on the street that we've never met. Are you Howard and Michaela? Yeah, we are. Oh, we remember what happened. We were, we were praying for you. And we figured there were, in, in China, in Japan, in North America, and people all over the world started praying for her and praying for us. But, you know, I, I realized we're going to be here for a while. And I think it was on the Tuesday. So I got there on the Sunday. The event all happened for her on the Wednesday. She was in the hospital Thursday. Monday, I spent the whole day with her, and it wasn't much improvement from, from Sunday to Monday. And, and on Tuesday, I just realized, I said, okay, this is, this is not going to be a quick fix. But we're both totally self-employed. Neither one of us have employment benefits. Neither one of us have anybody looking out for us. And I, I, remember, I remember being in that hospital room about 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and I just got, I remember getting down on my knees, and I said, all right, God. I said, uh, I, said I, I don't know what you're going to do. I know you, got a, you said that you have a plan for everything. You have a plan and a purpose for everything that you do. And God, I just have to trust that you have a plan for this. And Lord, if, if, if part of your plan is taking, for her, taking her from me, I promise you, and I'm on my knees praying this, and you're in the bed listening to it. And I, God, if your plan is taking her from me, I promise you I will not begrudge you this. She was yours before she was ever mine. And if you're taking her home, I'll live with that. But until you do and you show me that that's what you're up to, I'm going to keep petitioning for her. We're going to keep praying for her, God. And I'm believing in a miracle and a breakthrough for her. And God, you've got, you got to begin to heal her. But in the meantime... I can't run my business, and she can't run her business, and I think you've given me a brand new job. You want me to love my wife, and you want me to care for her. And so, Lord, when I take on this new job, I need to give you my business. I'm giving you her business. I'm giving you our finances, because I don't know how we're going to pay our mortgage. I don't know how we're going to feed ourselves. We're on the other side of the world. I don't know where the provision is going to come from. And so, God, I give you everything. I give you my wife. I give you my life. I give you my business. I give you her business. I give you everything we own. It's all yours. And whatever you do with it is entirely up to you. I prayed that prayer. And I'm not exaggerating and I'm not kidding when I tell you that five minutes later, I got an email from one of the major five financial institutions here in Canada, the name of which you would recognize, and the email went something like this. 
We're hosting a sales conference in December. We're bringing the entire team out. We've chosen you as a sales keynote. I, I mean, it was so easy. I just, I, I thought it was a joke. We're choosing a keynote speaker. We'd like to have a quick chat just to, just to finally ensure that there's a, a final fit. I wrote back. I said, I can probably talk to you tomorrow morning. I, I pick, we picked up the phone. We had a conversation. And they said, well, how do we get you on site? I said, you, here's my fee. You send half in a check now. You, you give me half when I show up. And I'm busy with a medical emergency in Germany. You just have to trust me that I'm good for it. This is a major Fortune 5 bank. Vice president of sales for this major Fortune 5. They cut me a check on the spot. I've never met him. I've never shaken his hand. And there was no contract. And a major chunk of money came in. I went, oh, man, you are good. I don't know how you pulled this off. <laughs> that doesn't happen in today's world. That, does, that just doesn't happen. And, and I, I just know that it was his hand upon this, and he moved things in some supernatural way to pull that off. I don't know how he did it. It's none of my business. I gave it to him, and that's what he did with it. <laughs> the interesting thing is, Michaela was in rehab for a long time after that, and, 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 and well, even while we're still in Germany, and the company that she was working for, her, the one company, her major client, as a consultant, never cut her consulting fees. Our provisions were met. We never missed a paycheck. We never missed a meal. We never missed a bill. I don't know how he pulled that off. So we're sitting there. That's a Tuesday. I lay out that prayer. Wednesday, I lock up the deal. And I show, so I show up to the hospital that morning. And, <laughs> you know, she was in pretty bad shape on the Tuesday. I show up to the hospital on, on that morning. And I'm going to read you something. I, I was sending everybody back home and all the people in our circle. I was sending little email updates. And I, I, I wrote this on the next Wednesday morning. And here's, I just want to read this to you. Good morning, everyone. I didn't expect to be sending an update this quickly, but it's way too good not to share. I'm stunned and I'm leaping with joy. Words can't even begin to explain it. This morning I went to the hospital and I didn't find my weak, light, my, my weak listless life, wife lying in bed. She was sitting upright at a chair at her little kitchenette table playing with her dog toys. That's what we have affectionately called her rehab tools. <laughs> and she just looks over at me and smiles. Are you kidding? She wasn't in bed. Yesterday she was bedridden. Today she's sitting in a chair at a table playing with her toys. <laughs> There, there, was, there was a new patient in the room, and the doctor there was having a consultation with the patient, so they threw me out. Literally, the doctor just threw me out of the room and said, you've got to get out of here. It's a private consultation. I said, you're in German. I don't understand. It doesn't matter. Get out of here. So she threw me out. And after about 45 minutes of standing in the hall, I guess Michaela must have gotten tired waiting for the doctor to leave, so she just got up and walked out to the hallway to find me. No cane, no crutch, no wheelchair, just her on her own two feet and legs. I thought it was the doctor leaving the room, so I asked, can I go in now? And I was stunned when Michaela turned around and said, no, but I'm not waiting for you anymore. <laughs> she wasn't fast, she wasn't nimble, it wasn't pretty, but she was under her own power. It's pretty unbelievable. <laughs> the nurses love her and they think she, she's funny, uh, so they're taking pretty good care of her. They even sneak her the good coffee once in a while, bring her some goodies from outside. And watching Michaela and her and them get on like this is like watching a comedy routine. They're making jokes constantly and having a blast laughing their guts out. And I think that's the thing. It was a very, I mean, it, this was still serious. I mean, she, she, did not, she was not able to stay under her own power very long. She made it to the door, and then I basically carried her from there and, and got her back in the room. But I didn't think I'd see her on feet until at least six months, and that's what the doctors were preparing us to see. And, you know, when you just cry out to God in desperation and really open your heart because you've got a relationship with him, he'll answer that. You know, we, we still, you know, we're, we're on the other side of the world. Here's, here's, here's another crazy little thing. I showed up on the Sunday. Of course, Michaela hadn't talked to any of her German friends, so I got emails out to everybody, hey, guess what, I'm back. And uh, I, I had rented a car, had made provisions to, to rent a, a hotel for, the, for as long as I needed to stay there. I didn't know how I was going to pay for any of this. On the Monday morning, her friend Hannes says, I took the day off of work because, listen, I'm going to make some arrangements for you. He says, I have two furnished apartments in the next town over. One is, one is a completely furnished apartment. It stands alone in the middle of town. The other one is a furnished basement suite in, uh, in the house where we live, which would you prefer? Now, part of me wanted to stay in the one in town because I just didn't want distractions. I just wanted to be alone. But I love their kids, and their kids love us, and so I felt out of obligation I should choose the one where the kids were staying. So I chose that one and was almost regretting it before I did it, but I knew it was the right thing to do. The mother-in-law who stays, they have, a, they have a basement suite, they have their suite, and they have the mother-in-law's suite up on the top floor. The mother-in-law comes down one morning. She says, we've known each other for years, but I never told you what I do. She's a rehabilitation nurse who specializes in stroke, stroke patients, and she spent, the next, she spent the next several weeks, well, the next of my whole time there, training me how to train her to rehab, which was going to become so important because when we got back to Vancouver, 
she wasn't providing any rehabilitation care. Hannes gave me his apartment. He says, I'm going to be out of town for the next three weeks. Have my car. You can, you can stay with my wife. You can play with my kids. And by the way, my mother-in-law is going to teach you how to rehab your wife. You think, you think anybody could line that up? It, it, it's not possible. So we got home. Here's the amazing thing. On the Friday of that week, just a little over a week after the first events, when we had decided, we knew for sure this was going to be a six-month ordeal in hospital in Germany, the doctor said, you're strong enough, you can go home. There's a lot more to this story, because when we got home, the, the last thing the doctor said to us, well, we had to go through a lot of rehab. Just to show you how, just to kind of give you an idea how, how serious this was, we brought home the MRI pictures from Germany, and we submitted them, to, we had made some phone calls so we could get into the Canadian medical system by the time we got here. We have a doctor in the church, Dr. Gentis. He made some connections. He hooked us into the, uh, into the neurology department at VGH. They got us to, we ended, up, we ended up meeting a doctor who basically, she introduces herself like this. She says, okay, before I say anything, I need to tell you something. I get the worst cases in, I get the, I get the hardest cases in Vancouver. So the fact that you're here says a lot of things. Um, and before I show you the picture of your MRI, I want to tell you something. Most of my patients have two or maybe three scars on their brain as a, as a result of the strokes. And they could be paralyzed and perhaps speechless for the rest of their lives as a result of that damage to their brain. Now I'm going to show you your picture. You see all those lines and all those dots that look like snowflakes? Those are all scars. You don't have two or three. You've got hundreds of them. And I can't explain how it is that you walked into my office today. And I looked at the doctor and I said, I can. We both know that you're a great doctor, and we are grateful for the thick hair you're going to give us, but we both know you didn't do this. We've been on our knees praying day and night and day and night, and the doctor looked at me and said, that's the only thing that can explain what I'm looking at. There's a lot more to this story. We then had to go deal with the, with, with, with the, with the, ble the bleeding issue one morning, just poof, broke loose, series of surgeries to get that one dealt with. And in October this last year, I had a, I had a, I had an, so we, we, we began the road to recovery, and she started getting stronger and stronger and stronger. And then uh, in October last year, I had an engagement in Chicago, which happened to coincide with her birthday. So I went and did my engagement, my speaking engagement, my training program, and flew her in to spend the weekend. When we went down, it was over Thanksgiving weekend, her birthday. We went down for the weekend, flew home Thanksgiving Monday. Actually, interesting enough. While we were in Chicago, Greg Geary, the, guy, the man who just introduced me, basically invited us for Thanksgiving dinner. So we, we, we landed in Vancouver at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, went to the store, bought some apples. Michaela baked an apple pie. We took it to the Geary's, had dinner with them, came home 5 o'clock Tuesday morning, the following morning. She wakes up in pain, screaming, I can't move, I can't move. I'm in total pain. She was completely paralyzed again. Into the hospital by now. Her medical history is pretty well documented at VGH. They treat her like with kit gloves, um, teams and teams and teams all over. As we discovered it had nothing to do with the stroke. She had a complete spinal collapse. And the next morning, the doctor said, you're going, in for, uh, you're going in for emergency spinal surgery. When? You're next on the list. And they basically opened her up from the back of the head down to the middle of the shoulder blades and opened up, basically cut the top of her entire vertebrae up to allow the thing to breathe. And here she is. So it's been, it's been a pretty wild journey. But one thing we can tell you for sure is that it doesn't take two, it takes three, and I think what we've discovered is it actually takes four. And what I mean by that is, and I've had a lot of conversations with people who say, well, I know God, but I don't, I, don't, well, I don't need a church. You know, telling somebody they need to go to church, that's religion. You know, and so it's not about if you go to church, you go to heaven. If you don't go to church, you go to hell. It's not that. But here's the thing. We have a relationship with God. We have a relationship with Jesus Christ, and that church helps us feed that relationship. And when the chips were down, we had a community that would stand with us. And I think what I learned from all of this, you can know God, but the reason why you need a church is because that church will give you a community to come and stand in the gap with you. And if you don't show up at the church, you don't have the community. And that, that community of believers will do things for you that your so-called normal circle of friends can't. And we really discovered the value and the power of that. When there were days I reached out to our group. I said, man, I don't even know what to pray anymore. And they just said, we'll do the heavy lifting now. You've done all you can do. And so my encouragement to you is, you know, if we've said anything here that touches you at all, just search out a community that can be standing in the gap with you when the chips are down. And, you know, I'm just, I, just, I just know that God is good because I know that we wouldn't be here being able to share this story and stand in front of you if we didn't have the power of our community and we didn't have the, ch the power of our Lord Jesus Christ. I know that for sure because I was prepared several times in the last couple of years just to say goodbye to her and, and grieve. I love my wife. She's my best friend. I love my church, and I love my Lord. And I just thank you for letting us share that with you.